And it's always good to start a portion, a Torah portion, with a, a new week, with a new fresh word. So uh, I will speak to you today from Toldot, where we left, and I will continue from Toldot for, forward, because those next four parashiyot, all first parashot, are dealing with the life of Jacob. And how many of you have not been here uh, with me yesterday. Quite a few were not here yesterday, so that's okay. I am, I am going to try to summarize in a minute, and those who are interested to finding us more about us, first of all, I'll say we have some resources today available in the back for those who are interested, uh, especially our uh, 12 volumes on Genesis. But we are part of an organization called Avatami. Avatami means for the love of my people. It's an organization that is focused on restoration and reconciliation between Yeshua and the house of Israel. And it's happened to be that we've been talking about this exact topic yesterday, last night, and I'm continuing with this topic today. God has called us now to establish what I would call a redemptive roadmap for redemption, okay, for Geula. There is a roadmap that is being built. And if you look at the life of Jacob, you're going to notice the clear pattern, the clear pattern for roadmap. So those who are watching us online uh, right now, you're welcome. Hopefully you can catch the PowerPoint behind me. Um, please share, like it, do whatever you need. But I want you to uh, kind of make a note for yourself we were in Parashat Toldot, we're going from the Parashat to Parashat Yetzeh, and then we're going to, to go to Ishlach, and then Vayashev. All four portions deal with the life of Jacob quite extensively, okay? And they provide us through the life of Jacob a complete roadmap, a complete roadmap for the redemption of not just the house of Israel, but the redemption of the entire world, okay? Tonight what I want to do with you briefly, I want to touch on a few principles of establishing this roadmap together. It's important for us to understand through the life of Jacob where we are in the roadmap and how is it applied to us so we understand what we need to do in these last days. Just to recap, in Parashat Toldot, we, we begin the portion, Toldot again, the word Toldot means the birth, the conception, the baby being born, and his who is being born, Jacob is being born, and Esau is being born, and I explained yesterday to you that this birth has to do with the birth pangs of the Mashiach. Okay, it is talking about the coming of the Messiah. Remember, it's called in the book of Isaiah, Chevlea Mashiach, the travails of the Messiah, the birth pangs of the Messiah. Right as a woman bear a child after nine months of, of carrying it, the same is true of the Messiah. And if we were to say where we are at right now, we're not in the first trimester, we're not in the second trimester, we're in the final of the final of the third trimester. We're on the ninth month right now. Now, in this process of being birthed and seeing the conflict that took place in the womb, we saw that Yaakov and Esav, they conflict already in the womb. And a matter of fact, just to remind you, the word that is used in Hebrew is the word Vayitrotzetsu. The Trotzetsu is the Hebrew word that comes from the Hebrew word Ratzutz and the word Ratz. They ran to each other like two, two bulls that ran into each other and just just collapse. Okay, they're fighting. Now when there is a conflict, as a reminder to you, there is a re reason for the conflict. Anybody remember from yesterday, what is the reason for the conflict between Esau and Yaakov? They're not even born yet, yes, they're already in conflict. What is the purpose for the conflict? It's one thing and one thing only. Our rabbis explained to us that the reason for the conflict is the fact that they're fighting for the kingdom. Who is going to rule the kingdom? There are two kingdoms. There's a kingdom from above and a kingdom from below. And they are trying to fight for the inheritance of those kingdoms. 
Okay? Yeshua has told us that the kingdom of God is, in, oh, is on hand. The centrality of the gospel, he has to do with the kingdom. There is nothing more important than the kingdom of God. So when we are talking about something that is worthy to have a conflict over, it is the kingdom. Please understand, the feud between Esau and Yaakov is a worthy feud to have. Now I want to remind you that when there is a conflict, it means that something great is about to happen. What? Yeshua told us in the book of Luke, chapter 12, I did not come to bring peace, I come to bring conflict. Wait, but he is called the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. If he is called the Sar Shalom, why is he bringing conflict to the world? Remember what I explained to you yesterday, that conflict, his essence is the catalyst, a conflict for the sake of heaven, right? A conflict for the sake of heaven is a catalyst for the redemption. Remember that always. When there is a conflict for the sake of heaven, it means that the Geula is at hand. Now we learned yesterday that when we look at the Torah, we must use the guiding principle that is given us by the, the, the Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, who say, Maaseb avot siman labanim. The work of the fathers is a sign for us today in the last days. In essence, you need to pay attention. The reason there is four parashot that deal with the life of Jacob, it's because there is so many signs for us in four parashot in the next three weeks that have to do with the signs of the last times for us. And it should be a comforting to you to know that you are not alone. You're not struggling with this thing alone. Jacob struggled with those same things. But we can learn from those things. We can learn where Jacob was successful, where he failed, and how he did, what he do, and how he did this. In essence, what I'm telling you, if we truly want to see the gospel, we don't have to go to Matthew or John or Luke or even to Revelation. All what we have to do is to read Genesis 25 all the way to Genesis 33, and you will be able to see the full God plan of redemption. You will be able to see the conflict and you will be able to see the resolution of the conflict. So again, when we look at the Torah, please understand, we are looking back at the future. You remember the movie Back to the Future? That's what it is. You're looking back into the future because Torah has to do with prophecy. So really, who is Isav? Who is Isav in this story? Who is Yaakov in this story? Well, we know who is Yaakov in the story. It should be very clear. Yaakov's name was changed to Israel. It cannot be any clearer than that. Who is Yaakov? Yaakov represents Israel. What about Esau? Who is Esau representing the story? Today I'd like to get a little bit deeper with you. And we can start with what Abarbanel says. Rabbi Yitzchak Abarbanel. Now, today's lesson is going to be a tad different. So I need you to pay attention. He, say, he says, Rabbi Yitzhak Barbanel, he says, The soul of Esau reincarnated in the Christian Yeshua. And that is why he was in the desert, a man of quarrel and strife. That's true, Yeshua says, I came to bring strife to the world. He's right. Or to the Pharisees and sages. And his name is like the name of Esau. And a matter of fact, when you take the name Esav and you look at the numerical value of the word Esav, you get two, two, two important words. You get the word Shalom, which means peace. Very interesting. But you also get the value of the word Yeshua. Allow me to suggest to you today, as we're going through this, that Esav is a picture of Christianity as a whole. And a matter of fact, starting in the second temple destruction, okay, with the second second destruction, when the rabbi started to look at the prophecies, especially in like the book of Daniel and other places, his name was Edom. And Edom is a known, if you go to any Jew in the world, say, who is Edom? They will tell you Edom is Christianity. 
It's a name, it's a code word for all of Christianity today. Edom comes from the Hebrew word dam and blood, and that's exactly what has taken place in the last 2,000 years. It's true. And a matter of fact, to recap yesterday, this roadmap for Geula, I present to you this diagram that resembles the shape, everybody should see it, of a cross. On the left side, you have Esav represent Yeshua. And again, what was Esav about? Esav was a man of Malet's side. He was filled with the game, with the blood. He was filled in the things that related to what we say, Olam Azeh. He was concerned about this world. Remember what I told you, the kingdom, this is important. The kingdom has two parts. The kingdom has a part above and their kingdom have a part below. There are two types of kingdoms. And they are divided. They are fighting over those kingdoms. Yaakov and Esau, this is really what this is about. It is about the fighting over the dominion of the kingdom of God. Esau, on the left side, represents Olam Azeh. Esau also represents Christianity. Esau also represents the Messiah who is son of Joseph. Esav also represent the Gola, the exile. Okay, think about this. Who exiled the Jewish people? Who took the menorah? Think about those things. On the right side, we have the Olam Abba, the world to come. We see the other entity. His name is Yaakov, who is called Israel. He represents Judaism. He represents Messiah, son of David, and he represents the Geula, the redemption of Israel. It is a picture of the cross. But notice that in the cross, there is a middle pillar. And yesterday I left you with a question, what is the middle pillar represent? Who is the middle pillar? We learned that the middle pillar is the Mashiach himself. In essence, everybody has to be grafted into the Messiah. Jew and non-Jew. But we also learn something very, very important about the middle pillar. We learn about the middle pillar that the revelation of this middle pillar, in the Zohar speak about this a lot, this revelation of the middle pillar is happened by the nations. It's happened by Israel. There is some people who are going to be revealed Mashiach to the world. I would like to believe that the middle pillar in the cross that Judaism speaks about so much is none other than Messianic Jewish movement. Do you want to know what I believe? I believe that that's why God has raised the Messianic Jewish movement to be a middle pillar between Judaism and Christianity. But as I explained to you yesterday, through this process, this middle pillar has a name to it. I found a better picture. Hopefully this picture will make a clear sense to you. On the left side we have Jacob. On the right side we have Yeshua or the follower of Yeshua. What about the middle pillar? Yesterday I introduced you to a Hasidic term. Again, it was very difficult to explain it in the short time that I had. But this term is the term Berur. I explained to you yesterday what is a berur. A berur is a term that's speaking about, I'm still having difficulty to describe the word berur, but I would say a berur is revelation, revealing Jacob and revealing Esau. Not all of Jacob is Jacob and not all of Esau is Esau. It's in essence unmasking them. It's the Berurim represent the Tikkun, the, the work that we do to prepare the ground for reconciliation. Okay? Before there could be a reconciliation between Yaakov and Esav, they have to do the mitzvot, we have to do the Torah, we have to prepare the ground, right? If you go to put seed in the ground, you cannot just throw seed in the ground, you have to loosen the soil. In Hasidic thought this term of loosening the tall soil is called the birur. Birur is literally mean clarification. Okay, who is really Yaakov? Okay, who is really Esau? What is the feud between them? Oh, the feud is on the kingdom? Let's talk about it for the sake of the kingdom. There is an historic 
There is truly an historic feud between Judaism and Christianity. And somehow we have to do the biru of this. And how do you do the biru of this? It has to start with a conflict. And that's why Genesis chapter 25, before we can talk about Geula, has to start with a conflict. So today I was able to really sit and meditate upon what I was explaining yesterday. And I came up with a formula that looks like that. Hopefully it will help you. Conflict for the sake of heaven will lead to Berur. And here is the actual definition, the classical definition of the word Berur. Berur means investigation, clarification, inquiry. And actually if you say Beberur, it means to go through something and get clarity explicitly. In essence today we have to get an explicit answer. Who is Yeshua? Who is Christ what is Christianity? Who is Jacob? We have to get a clarity around this before there is a reconciliation. So we have to kind of loosen the, 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 the ground through the concept that is called Berur. Okay, we have to go through this. Interestingly enough, conflicts are never, pain, never good, but Yeshua came to cause those, those conflicts so that the Beru will be complete. But there is another step, that's why you see the question mark, before the Geula. And that's where I would like to spend a lot of time, or not a lot, but some of the time today, to explain to you the next step. Yesterday I did not have the time to get into this detail, but right now I can. There is another step after the Beru. Beru is the tikkun olam that we are doing. In practicality, it's us going today to the world and telling to the world, hey, we go into the churches and we say to the churches, Jesus was not a Christian guy. Jesus was a Jew. That's called a Beru. I listened to you, Daniel, this morning, and you said, sometimes you see in the movies, Jesus is a blue, blue eyes, blonde guy. But he's not. He looked dark and he was not very attractive because it said so. He was like me, like 5'9", you know, on a good day, 5'8 and, and a half. <laughs> That's called a Beru, okay? We recategorize him. But what I'd like you to know, that Beru is not enough. Yes, we can go to the church. Yes, we can go to Christian and we can tell them this thing again and again and again. That is not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough in the eyes of Jacob or in the eyes of Esau. Christianity. There is another step that is missing. Yes. This year is a bit different because I am dealing with you today, tonight, with the topics that are very, very deep. There are concepts that you find in Hasidut. Okay? With a language that might be somewhat unfamiliar to you today. Instead of worrying about memorizing all the terms that I will introduce to you, it's more important to, you, me, to me that you understand the concepts. Okay? So please pay attention to the concept. Okay? Now, to understand this, to understand where we're coming from, we have to understand why Hasidut is important. Why when God read Hasidic Judaism, we came one step closer to the Geulah of Mashiach. Everybody needs to understand there was a sect of Judaism that started to... Uh, Judaism, let's go back even to Maimonides' time, is what we call rationalism. Everything has to be rationalized by the mind. If you cannot take one plus one and make it equal to two, we have to dissolve it. That's rationalism. After rationalism, there was in Eastern Europe, right, a movement that came that called Hasidic Judaism. Now, what was the big thing about Hasidic Judaism? That Hasidic Judaism believed that you are not only to look at things through your mind, but you are to, to look at things through experience, experiences. God is in everything. God is in everywhere. And it doesn't mean that you have to explain it. Of course, there is a sect of Judaism after Lithuania, right, out of Vilna, the Gaon of Vilna. They became called the Mitnagdim. What does it mean, the Mitnagdim? The Mitnagdim are those who oppose the Hasidut. Okay? 
So, of course, Hasidut started, if you want to be technical, with a man named the Baal Shem Tov, right? Everything that we know today, which we talk about Chabad, like a Chabad movement, came out of the Baal Shem Tov in some way, shape, or form, okay? Now, the question that we must ask ourselves is, how do we gap rationalism with the supernatural, okay? And that's the, the, the amazing thing about Judaism moving one step forward, okay? The Hasidic Judaism surface, surfacing up, it means that we're one step closer to the coming of the Messiah. Please understand this. Hasidic Judaism is the closest thing, in my opinion, for the truly the messianic experience, without a doubt, okay? Now, what if God called the messianic movement to be part of this historic Beru. I want to challenge this for a moment and tell you that we are not the only pillar in the middle that taking part of this historic Beru. I believe this Beru is going to be part of it, is going to be, Chabad is going to be part of it. And I believe that this network that they build all over the world of Chabad houses is going to be used to serve the real Messiah. I know it sounds crazy, but I believe that in all my heart. God preparing this ground, and the Beru is happening from both sides. The Beru happened from Yaakov's side to Esau, and from Esau's side to Yaakov. The Beru have two parts to it. Okay? But please understand that the true nature of the Beru is the Beru of who is Esau. If you want to know the truth about the Beru, the true Beru is really to find out here the true identity of Esau. And in the essence, Parashat Toldot, if you kind of divide it, Parashat Toldot and Parashat Vayetze, right, which, which is happening this week, the focus is on the Beru. The first part of Yaakov's life is focused on the Beru and the Tikkun. He's doing Tikkun, look at his life, okay? He is pulling the light out of the darkness. He has to discern who is who. Okay? In Hasidut, it's called the gathering of the sparks. If you want to understand what Yaakov is doing in the beginning of his life, he is gathering all the sparks. He's doing all the tikkunim to prepare, to prepare for the next the next, next um, a, a stage of Geulah that we're going to learn about today, okay? Now, the tikkunim that he is doing are tikkunim in what's called the world below. Those are tikkunim in the world around us. Shmirat mitzvot, bringing people to the Torah, those are tikkunim that happen in the world below, okay? But there is other set of tikkunim that have to happen in the world above. There are two sets of tikkunim that are happening, okay? And the question that we ask ourselves is simple. This is an important question to ask. Is our tikkunim in the world below? In essence, I am going to say I am Shomer Mitzvot today. I am teaching Torah. I am doing Gmilut Chasadim. I'm building synagogues all over the world. Is these things are enough? Are those enough to bring to the ultimate tikkun, which is the return of the Mashiach? That's the ultimate tikkun. Is it enough? And the answer is no. I want you to understand this. We can hasten the geula. We can hasten it by tikkunim, but it is not enough. As a matter of fact, even Yeshua related to this gathering of the sparks, Matthew 23. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, along to gather your hand, gather your cheeks. But you are not willing. Your house will be left desolate until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. And I should say, yes, yes, I want to gather you. I am doing the tikkunim from above, but if you don't do the tikkunim from below, nothing going to happen. There is a co-dependent relationship on the tikkunim that needs to happen in heaven and the tikkunim that is happening here below. Okay? And in the first part of his life, and here's the thing, you can do a tikkun all around you. But unless other people come and they do the tikkunim with you, 
It doesn't matter. A tikkun is a corporal activity. Now, how do we do those tikkunim? How do we prepare the world to this reconciliation? It's all going to happen only through this middle pillar, like I explained to you yesterday, I showed you yesterday, only through the middle pillar, Dvar Torah, okay? You and I are bringing people outside Edom to the middle pillar, which is the Mashiach, okay? We can complete the Beru. Now, it's important to understand that this generation is a generation right now that I believe we are doing a historic Beru of who is Issa. Some of you are involved in ministry. That's what you're doing. You go to your Christian friend and say, you got Jesus all wrong. You got the wrong Jesus. Right? Great that you're doing that. But let me give you a newsflash. That's not going to bring Mashiach to the world. You can go to every church in the world and tell them to the Biru and say, no, you got it wrong. It is still not going to be enough. There has to be a conflict. It's a conflict for the sake of heaven. Okay? When Yeshua says in, the, in Luke 12, when he says, I came to bring division, he said, hasten the biru. That's in essence what he's saying, which is the next task. He's speaking a language, Jew, and he said, hasten the biru, because the biru will bring the world one step closer to the geula. Now, the middle pillar, in my opinion, is responsible for the reconciliation, okay? It's truly, we are responsible for reconciliation that will take place after the Berur in the Geula. <coughs> I would like to speak to you about this painful process. This is what we call the birth pangs. It's a painful process of Berur, and what's going to follow it? What is next? Where we need to be next? And here as I'm going to shock you. How many of you believe? that we are in the stage of birur, of investigating who is Mashiach. Judaism, Hasidic Judaism, would flat out disagree with you. Judaism says the stage of birur is over. And a matter of fact, the stage of birur has been over, according to Judaism, for over 2,000 years. Very interesting. Wait a second. So if there is no Beru, we know who is who. The next question is asking why the Geulah is not here. Right? If we know that he is the Mashiach, why the Geulah is not here? Because there is another stage after the Beru. That's why we pray in Yom Kippur. We say in the prayer for Yom Kippur, we pray, bring the Mashiach out of Edom. It's not that the Jews don't know he's a Mashiach. There is another stage to before the final Geulah happen. And that's where I think we need to focus all of our attention on. See, each side, Yaakov and Esau, represent, both represent an aspect of the Geulah. And only through the Berur and what's happening the, after this. And here's what's coming after it. I'm going to explain this to you now. But think about the Nachash. Right? Something you're all very, very familiar with. Nachash. Nachash in Gimatria is equivalent to Mashiach. A serpent, which is the klipa, which represents something so unholy. Something that may represent the Mashiach. Why? Why is it so, so, so significant? Because, you see, only when Nachash can really shed his skin, the shedding of the skin, he can be revealed for truly what he is. You can know something is something that you think it is, but unless it's, he, he, the Beru uh, uh, shed the, 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 and reveal him in the right light, it's still not going to lead you to the right conclusion. You know, you can say, oh, yeah, I know Yeshua. I had a funny thing happen to me. I was last, uh, I think 10 days ago, I was in the Vatican. And I was stunned. And the guy turned to me in the Vatican and started speaking to me in Hebrew. <coughs> and he says, we love the Jewish brothers. I said, that's wonderful. And he says, yeah, 
Jesus was a Jew. We love our elder brothers. And I said, you know, Peter was a Jew too. And he go, don't go so fast. <laughs> you know, there is a difference between knowing something and willing to accept it and acting upon the biru. It's like, you know, think about the biru. You know, a biru is when you go to trial and you get the ruling from the court. Now there is a step of execution. And the final step of the Geula is not the verdict, but it is the execution of the verdict. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? And our rabbi said, no, the verdict, we know, we knew for a long time. We are in another level right now. We are in the level that's called the execution of the verdict. There is a Hasidic word for that, very nice Hasidic term for this. But I'm trying to explain it to you in a way you understand very deep concepts today. But if the Beru, let me get back to our Beru for a second, which is like a verdict. If the Beru is, that we do is inappropriate, and the snake will not shed his skin properly, he cannot be revealed as the Mashiach. I don't want to diminish the Berur. Hasidic Judaism said the Berur is over. I am not quite sure the Berur is completely over quite yet. Okay? We need the authentic Berur to take place. But that's not where it's, where it's ending. Please understand this. Now, it is important to understand something about the Biru of Isav. This is something you need to understand. Some of you open your eyes really big when I say Isav is a picture of, the, of Christianity. It is. And he says, Isav, I hate it. Wow, what's that mean, you know? Please understand something. Again, today is a, is a lesson in Hasidic Judaism. It is important to understand one thing about Isav. Despite his wickedness, he has a critical role for Yaakov becoming the man that he needs to be in building this highway. In essence, Yaakov cannot fulfill his role without the opposition of Esau. Please understand that. He needs Esau. He needs Esau. Okay? Adversity in your life, you know what adversity? That's what Satan, Hasatan, those adversity in your life are there for a purpose to make you who you need to be to overcome those things. Each of the wicked serve an important purpose here. And I tell you what the purpose. Yaakov is going to build a highway of Geulah. He's going to build a highway for all human race, for all humanity, for the Geulah and reconciliation. Why? Because Esau represents the nations, Yaakov represents Israel. You want to know where the story ends? The world is being reconciled. The book of Zephaniah says, in that day all the world will speak one language, it will be Hebrew. Sorry, it's not going to be speaking in tongues. It's going to be Hebrew. <laughs> the term Esav, who is known in the scripture as Edom, starting the second temple, by rabbinical literature, refer exclusively to Christianity. And at the same time, although he is the greatest foe, the greatest enemy of Yaakov, here it is, are you ready? In the future. Acharita Yamim. He is going to be the greatest partner of Yaakov. I'm going to show it to you. He is going to be the closest friend and the closest partner of Jacob. The fact that we are living in a generation today where Goim encourage Jews to study Torah. In a generation when Gentiles support the land of Israel. It is nothing short of a beginning of the fulfillment of the Biru. 
You want to know where we are right now prophetically? We are in the process of the fulfillment of the Berur. Which is exciting time. These things we talk about are being fulfilled in front of our eyes. Now we need to understand something about the nature. This nature of the Beru. This is very, very important for us to understand it. The Beru is not just the Beru for Isa, but is a warning to Yaakov. Look what it says in the book of Psalms, chapter 80. It says... Why have you broken down its fences? What is the word fan broken down? It's the Hebrew word Torets. In the Hebrew text, is the word Poet is one of the names of the Messiah. There is a connection between the Messiah, I want you to look at this, between the Mashiach to an animal that is called a pig. I wrote the book, The Return of the Kosher Pig, but you're going to see it clearly here in a second. It's asking the question, why have you broken down the fences so all who pass by will pick its fruit? A chazir, a pig, from the forest now ravages it. Whatever moves in the field feeds on it. Now, how many of you think that the pig here is a good thing? It's not a very good thing. It's not talking about a regular pig. The reason it's talking about a pig in the forest, because it is a wild pig, a very deadly white, wild pig. Look what it says in Pirke Avot, Ethics of the Father, the Rabbi Nathan on this verse. They explain who is the pig? The kingdom of Rome, Christianity, Malchut Romi. Here you go. The pig from the forest, this is the kingdom of Rome. When Israel does not fulfill their calling, and I'm paraphrasing it, okay? I didn't translate word for word, I give you a paraphrasing. When Israel does not fulfill their calling, the nation are like a pig from the forest, wild, who destroyed the, ne the, the nefashot, the souls of the Israel. When Israel fulfilled their calling, the pig cannot harm them. What I'm trying to tell you, Esau has a role. And maybe, just maybe, we can understand why God has brought the pogrom, why God brought the Inquisition, why God brought six million souls to lose their lives. Maybe, just maybe, the Jewish people were not doing what they were supposed to do. And that's why they were consumed in the Holocaust. Let me tell you something. Most of the Jewish people during the Holocaust wanted to be part of their own society that is completely separate from Judaism. They didn't want to be Jews. They forgot the Judaism. So God used the nations. He used a man named Adolf Hitler to remind the Jewish people what they are called to. Yeah, it's true. Esau has a purpose. And the purpose of Esau is to really to make sure that Yaakov remain on the straight and narrow path. Now, there is another role for the pig. The Hebrew word pig comes from the word chazir. Look at what the Midrash continually saying about this verse. Absolutely amazing. He says, why has God called the kingdom of Edom Christianity? Why is it called as a pig? Because in the future, this is important, in the future it will return the kingdom to its rightful owner. Are you following what I'm telling you? There is something in essence that Esau has that Yaakov needs. I know it sounds crazy, but there is something truly that Christianity has today that Jacob truly need. And what is it? Atara le baalea. What is the word atara? That's where you get the word tiara in English. The crown of glory. The crown of, crown of glory is not in Zion. It is not in Jerusalem. The crown of glory is in Rome. Yes. You see, the Hebrew word pig is the word chazir. The word chazar means to return. The word pig and come back is the same Hebrew word. There is a play on words here. 
So it's not just that Esau is the wicked, but Esau has something very important. And in a minute we'll find what it is. It is the Mashiach himself. Today is a very deep lesson. I realize this. But I want you to understand this. Because it will make sense in the sense of prophecy. I explained to you this earlier. That, that the age of Biru is critical. But according to Hasidic thought, we are in the end. Where we are right now prophetically, we are either in the end of Berurim, or, 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 or the Berurim age is already finished. I would like to think that the age of Berur is already finished. And by the way, that's why you see Yeshua mentioned in so many Jewish prayers. Why? Because we know. It is not that Jacob doesn't know. But now Jacob needs to understand how to shed the skin of the serpent in order to reveal him as the Mashiach. Are you following what I'm telling you? The final stage of the Geula has a name. The final stage of the Geula is not a Birur, but it's actually called, in Hasidic thought, Chibur. We're going from a conflict. From a conflict we go to a Birur, from a biru, we go into a chibur. Chibur is the verdict. It's kind of the execution of the verdict. Okay? This is important that we understand it. We are right now in the last stage, and the last stage is called chibur. Okay? This is the age when the biru that we are done, are doing, has to have a physical action. Write yourself in your note. Chibur has nothing to do with faith. Chibur has to do with a physical action. A physical action to connect. Remember I spoke to you about the two worlds? To connect the world below and the world above. Connecting them together. The essence is not the biru. And matter of fact, Chabad, Hasidic Judaism today, rejected the age of, of, of Beru. They said, that's gone. We are now in a new age, in an age of Chibu. Okay? And they explain which Chibu. Are you ready? They say, it's a Chibu that will cause. This is amazing. I nearly, literally heard a Midrash about this last week in Israel. We are in the age of the chibur, and the chibur comes when we shed the klipa, which is the husk, the, the facade of Esau. Are you following what I'm saying to you? In essence, it's an age that we reveal to the world the true identity of Esau. That's our only task right now in the world. Okay? The essence of the chibur of the two worlds is the chibur of Jacob of Esau. You want to know the most single, most important thing right now? According to Judaism, chibur between Judaism is Christianity. Chibur between Yeshua and the brothers. This is not my teaching, friends. I am teaching you today Hasidic Judaism. The essence of the Geula is to move from Beru to Chibur, and that's where I want to explain to you. Beru is truly speaking about the separation of Esau from Yeshua. That's what is called Beru. Then you say, you know what? He wasn't a bad guy. A lot of ministries, that's all what they do. They go around the world, and they do this type of things, but that's not enough. Chibur is the connections of the two worlds. Okay, he's not the same guy, so what do you do about it? But they tell you what we do as a ministry about it. We're going to Africa, we're going to South America, we're going to, to Europe, and we establish communities where there's a tangible chibur between the house of Israel. And by the way, that's why the Hebrew Roots movement is such a problematic movement, because they don't have a chibur with Jacob. They want a chibur with Yeshua, without Jacob, but the chibur is between Jacob and Esau. That's why we need authentic messianic Jewish movement. Amen. The chibur 
In Hasidic language, it's called Chibur Leshoresh. What is the Shoresh? Shoresh is root. Chibur Leshoresh, the, the essence of Kedusha, the root of Kedusha. See, in essence, each one of us practice Torah for the sake of heaven, for the sake of the kingdom. Each one of us practice Gmilut Hasadim. But that's not enough. There has to be more. Chibu is much, much more. And God is calling to the Messianic movement today, I believe, for something much, much more. Much, much greater. He's calling us to be masters. Mechabrim. Connectors. Between Yaakov and between Esau. Who are we? We must be a little bit of Yaakov and we must be a little bit of Esau if we are to connect them. It's true. Not so easy, is it? See, our job is not today. This is a mistake. People just want to separate darkness from light, show right and wrong. But that is not enough when we talk about the Mashiach. We must unify the Mashiach again. We have to connect the Mashiach himself to a master Hebrew. And only to the collective power of the house of Israel, we can redeem his name. Let me say it clearly. According to Hasidut, the Redeemer is not the Messiah. You are the Redeemer of the Mashiach. How can it be? Well, the psalmist Say it like this. Psalm 55, 19, he says, He redeems me from the battle against me. It is as though many are on my side. What did he mean, the psalmist, when he says, There are ki berabim ayuimd? What does it mean? Hasidic thought come and explain to us exactly what it means. It means that when people pray together, they redeem each other. We redeem each other. Each one of us to have a redemptive power through him. The entire concept of a chibur is a concept that says that God is empowering you today to connect the worlds. What is a connector? That's a messiah. One who connects is a Messiah. God is giving each and every one of us a redemptive power today to connect those two together. You don't have to wait for Mashiach. Mashiach is in you. Mashiach lives through you. Each one of us must practice Torah for one purpose. Berabim ayu imdi. So that you will bring a redemptive power to somebody else. You want to know the essence of the Torah? That is the essence of the Torah. To your prayers, to your mitzvot, to your gmilut chasadim, you bring redemption to others. And that's how we get from the gula, gola, which is exile, we get to the geula, to the redemption. Notice that it's exactly the same Hebrew word, gola, geula, the only difference between those two words is the letter Aleph, which is God. Which means that when you do your part to bring redemption, God will partner with you and he will, do the, will bring his part in the redemption. Redemption is not one direction. The redemption has two directions. God is bringing a redemption and you're bringing redemption and we meet together. And now we are in a time that God is calling us to unite to bring this, this redemption to the world. Now, the aspect of Birur is, again, is critical. But the next step of the Geula, that's what we call show me the money. I call it show me the money stage. When we do the work to, to do the Chibur, it is more critical. There are things that are more critical than our theology. There are things that are more important to discuss every time. Why is it that nobody is speaking about those terms? But when I put a video talking about the rapture, I get like a million likes. Where is people minds? Who cares? The body of Messiah just want to talk about those type of things. That's a Beru. That's a Beru. This is a children game. We need to grow up. 
We need to get now to the Chibur stage. We are in much higher Madrega, much higher level. The next step of Geulah right now, it's the final steps. And you know why Chabad is so successful? Because that's all what they do. They're building those centers all over the world, setting the ground. Please understand, this is biblical. It is biblical because the Geulah is near us. The question today was we must ask ourselves is how do we do the Hebrew? If the Hebrew is the last step before the Geulah, how do we do it? What is required of us? Look with me at the book of Proverbs. It provides us the answer for this. Okay? In essence, the question we need to ask, what do we need to do to bring Hebrew to the world? Look at what it says. It says, Yafutsu ma'ayonotai chutza barechovot pilgei ma'ay. Proverbs 5, 16. One of the most wonderful messianic verses. Which translated. Your spring will gush forth in streams in the public squares. First of all, we need to understand what the rabbis teach about this. They say, when the water, listen to this interpretation, incredible. When the water will go outwards to an unexpected place, outwards. And what's the unexpected places when the water will go to? To Esau. Hello? When the water, what is the water? When the Torah will go forward to Esau, right there, right there the Geulah will come. That's the Hebrew. All right? Let me say to you in a simple language. When Jews will start inviting the Goyim to come and learn Torah, and the Goyim will learn the Torah, right there, the Hebrew with Tisa will be complete. Amen. You're following what I'm telling you here. Yeah. There is a story about the Baal Shem Tov. And in this story, the Baal Shem Tov go from world to world to world to world to meet Mashiach. Finally, he gets to the last world and he's meeting Mashiach. Then he asking the Mashiach, when will you come? The Mashiach answered to him, quoting this verse. And he said, when you do this, I will surely come. This is the final, this is a real Hebrew. In essence, the coming of the Mashiach, depending upon our people to come, to bring the people to the middle pillar. Okay? As a matter of fact, look what the Malbim says on this. There are two words that are mentioned in this text. Right? He said, you will bring the springs. Springs, water represents the Torah. You are to bring them outside Chutza Barechovot. It's mentioned outside and it's mentioned the streets. Now why there is a redundancy? Why did the Torah mention outside Chutza and why it's mentioned the Rechovot? There is a difference. Look at what the Malbim says on this. Very, very interested. I took the liberty of translating it to you. I paraphrase. The Malbim says, there is a difference between taking waters outside and taking the water to the streets. The outside, look at that, represent the back of the homes. There is nobody there except those who live there. The street, on the other hand, is a place that is wide where many people are found. The street represents the Jewish people. The Jewish people need to teach Torah to other Jews. But you know what the Jewish people calling in the world is to take the Torah to the world. Achutza. And only when we take the Torah, achutza, outside the family, outside the house, then the Geula will come. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? There are two aspects here. Achutza and to the street. The street is to the house of Israel. Achutza is to Esau. The middle pillar have to be care about Esau learning. Because that's the only way Esau will be a, a, able to reconcile. The word achutza or chutza here, chutz. As a matter of fact, if you say I live in chutz la'aretz, if you say in Hebrew, I live in chutz la'aretz, 
I'm living abroad. That's literally what it means. In essence, the word has to spread outside of it. And think about the word of Yeshua when he say, You will be my witnesses first in the house, in Judea, in Samaria, and then to the rest of the world. Here you go. Word for word, the word of Yeshua. What is Chutzah? What is the place that the heart is to bring Kedusha to? Holiness to? Our sages explain that the hardest place to bring the Kedusha to is to Esau. Does it make sense to you? How many of you <laughs> try to go to your Christian friends and tell them about Torah? You know that this is the hardest place, but that's why he said that is the key to the return of the Mashiach. Yeah, it's a place that is lonely and cold. It's not the house of Israel. Yeah, do we, the Jews need to teach Jews Torahs? Yes! But that's not the only job of the Jews. Did you notice how many Jewish people start to teach Gentiles right now about the seven mitzvot Bnei Noach? It's growing all over the world. But my question, why stop there? Let's teach them more and more. Baruch Hashem, every Jew that teach Torah to a non-Jew. It's a great mitzvah. But you know, Chazal continue, Hasid, it explains that there is another place that is, when he's talking about, when he's talking about, I don't know if I can go backwards. Okay, there is another explanation for the Chutzah and the Rechovot. And they explain the word chutzah represents something else. I want you to think about it. The hardest place to bring Kedusha to. Chutzah represents the human mind. And they said the hardest thing for us to overcome, to go outside, is the human mind. Because the human mind always wants to put a limitation upon us. But Hasidut, that's why Hasidut is so important. Hasidut is not about logic. It's not logistical. It's about the power of God. That's what we call the power of the Holy Spirit. It's something that can transcend times. It can transcend, transcend space. All of those things. And Chazal said, when you go outwards, do not limit yourself by your mind. This is important. You understand? Judaism is all about logic, logistics. Logical. Hasidut is in the supernatural. Since the mind always question everything. To bring Kedusha to this place is the hardest. And I tell you something just on a personal warm front. If you want to think things outside in your own life, in your own ministry, do not question the God and do not work with this mind as the center for your decision. Work in a higher level. Sometimes God tells you to do things that your mind will tell you not to do. Listen to God. It is a struggle against ourselves to bring it outward. In essence, what I'm telling you today, we are limiting the Geula. It is not God who is limiting the Geula. It is us who are limiting the Geula by first trying to put God in the box and say, that's what I understand. That's, therefore, that's what I will do. That was the Chidush of the Hasidic movement. The Hasidic movement come and say, stop thinking about everything. And don't put God into the box. That's why when Rambam said, God can never take a form of a man as one of Rambam principle, Hasidic look at him and say, sorry, we disagree with you. Because God is above those things. Are you following what I'm telling you? That's why when people question you, say God can never take a form of a man. You can say, according to rationalist, rationalistic thought, you're right. But according to Hasidic thought, you are wrong. But look what the text says. The text says, Yafutsu Mayonatecha, a living water, right? Will be coming out of you. The question that you still need to ask yourself is why the water has to be poured outwards? Why is that a condition of the Geula, right? That is the Hebrew. When the water pour, people are thirsty and they come. That's why Yeshua said, come to me, those who are thirsty. And Yeshua said, I am the master Mechaber. 
come to me. He wants to be the connector. Why it is so important for both the street and those who are outside the street, Israel and the nations, why is it so important to them to both to drink from the same fountain? Are you ready? Friends, today is not messianic teaching. It's Hasidic teaching. That is Judaism. We all need to understand it because this is the truth. I am not teaching this. I am not teaching you something that, that, that I came up with. I'm just broadcasting to you today. And just put a little bit messianic commentary on this. It is because... Here's why it's so important for this water to be poured out. It is because the heavenly reality, there is a heavenly reality, and let me tell you about the heavenly reality. It is impossible to have two entities. It is impossible to have two kingdoms with two kings. It is important for everybody to drink the same water because there is one king and there is one crown. Esau cannot have the world. Remember what Rashi says. Esau said, I'll have the world below. Yaakov, you're going to have the world above. But Rashi says, it is impossible. The two kingdoms has to be converging into one kingdom. And the two forces, Yeshua slash Christianity, and Yaakov and Israel must become one. They must become one and they will become one. This is God's plan. This is not my plan. It's God's plan. To get us all into the same even level playing field. In the future, this plan will be completed through the Hebrew. And that's why we have Messianic Judaism today in the world. Israel is a metaphor in the text. Pay attention. This is amazing. Israel is a metaphor in the text to the sun. And what about the nations? What are they metaphor for? They are a metaphor for the moon. Israel called the sun, the nations called the moon. This is important. Look at what God is promising us in the book of Isaiah chapter 30 in the last days. He says, This is God's plan. And the light of the moon shall become as the light of the sun. Do you know that this moon and the sun will be the exact same size? And the light of the sun shall become a sevenfold like the line of the seventh end where the Lord bind up his people wounds. Here you go. He will bind up the people wounds and heal the injuries. It is a suffered. God is going to teach us, to tell us, the Midrash teaches us that the sun and the moon will be exactly the same size, with exactly the same light. And in a picture of our Hasidut, we call it the marriage. There's a different level to look at that. In one level, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles becoming one, the sun and the moon. But another way to think about this reunification is not just the reunification between the Jews and the Gentiles, but it's the unification that the Son represents God, the Son of Righteousness come with healing in the wing, and what does the moon represent? The Shekhinah, the Shekinah. And what is going to happen? The Shekinah and, and God will reunify again. And without getting into too much Hasidut, but Hasidut teaches that they both receive light, but today the light is unequal. And you know where do they get the light from? From the Bina, from the Son of Yah. Both of them going to radiate the same Son of God light. Both Israel and the Mashiach will radiate the same Son, the same light. This is amazing. They will receive the same light. The moon However, in the Midrash, we learned that the moon, which represents the nations, were not ready. Esau is not ready. But he will be equal when he's ready. Not Ribirurim, through Chiburim, he will be ready. That's why the texts tell us that there will be in the last day 100% equality connected imperfectly to the same root. 
okay? The chibu in the future will be much greater than anything we ever experience. And matter of fact, look what the text tell us. Jeremiah 31, 22. The rabbis quote that in the context. They says, how long will you weaver or rebel this daughter? Right? For the Lord has created something new on earth. A woman courts a man. This is an important text. Why does it say a woman? A man should be courting a woman. But the text said a woman will be courting a man. Why? Because all things, Chazal said, will be equal in these days. The man and the woman represent the Jew and the Gentile. You know that? This is not my interpretation. This is Hasidic Judaism interpretation. This is amazing. God wants to make Yaakov and Esau equal. As a matter of fact, I'm about to shock you. But the Midrash continue to explain it's like this. He explained the difference between the Yareach and the Shemesh, the sun, like that. He says, when Israel become betrothed to God, when you become betrothed, you don't give the big wedding, the gift to your wife. Not, not in Judaism. Israel receive a little gift. That represent, that actually represent the Yareach. The, um, the moon. They received the Torah. Small gift. That's not the real thing. The real thing is what Israel will receive when the reconciliation will occur. Much bigger gift. And the question is, what's the bigger gift? What's well, going to be bigger than the Torah? Let me tell you, the Torah is not the main gift. When the reconciliation will happen between Israel and Esau, Yaakov and Esau, here's what Israel is going to receive. Look at what Daniel says. And acknowledge, acknowledgeable will be radiant like the bright expanse of sky. And those who lead the many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. Israel will receive every star. You want to know what Israel will receive? Every star in heaven will be the wedding gift. Oh, what Israel will receive right now is a little gift. It's called the Torah. That's not the real gift. The real gift is every star that you see in heaven will be belong to Israel when they will recognize, reconcile with Esau. You see, we don't even have understanding of what's coming ahead of us. And the Torah portion this week in Toldot, this, this past week, we learned that even not just Rivka, but also Isaac have to go to the Birur of Isav. So we have to go to a Birur and we have to go to a Chibur. I just want to bring to you one or two points about the Birur. It says on the Birur of, 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 of Isaac, he says, Vaigash Yaakov el Aviv, and Jacob went named unto Isaac his father, and he felt him. And I explained to you already that the word felt is the word imshu. That's where we get the word Moshe. Why? Because part of the biru have to be with the connection to Moses, to the Torah. Vayomar, akol kol Yaakov, Please understand something. He's not saying that the voice is the voice of Jacob and the end is the end of Esau. There should be a question mark there. He's not really being tricked. He knows very, very well who is who. He's not stupid. It's actually kind of like a paradox. He said, the voice of the voice of Jacob, the hand and the hand. No, impossible. Okay? And he said, and he discerned him not. Now the word is because the hands were here. He knew. But he chose to close his eyes because he wanted the Keula to come. He understood that it's part of the redemptive, redemptive action. And look actually what it says in the very next verse. It says, Vayomer elav. Vayomer atazeb ni isav vayomer ani. And he says, Do are you Esau? He says, Yes, I am. And he says, Bring near to me. How did he do the biru? What did he do to the biru? Look what he did. He did a couple of things. He says to him, Feed me and bring me wine. And he drank. Why is important the word yain? The word yain in Gematria is equal to the word sod. It's the number 70. It's a picture of the 17 nations. 
70 nation the secret there is going to be some sort of a supernatural event that will bring the nations to secret to a mystery something supernatural who will bring them in to Isaac and he says and father Isaac said to him come and kiss me and the rabbi quoted Psalm 212 and said kiss the son let him not be angry who is the son is the Mashiach are you following what I'm telling you the bill here and like look what he did and he came to him and he kissed him and he smelled the smell of the ramen what is that Reach Bgadav, this the midrash teaches that he smell like heaven how do we do a bureau today number one we have to understand that we have to smell with the aroma of the mashiach when you kiss somebody you're going to smell like him and the aroma that was for you is the aroma of the mashiach is of today inside is wicked we already understand it there is there is a wicked but inside of him there is a part that are very very righteous and how do we find them how do we find those from Esau who are righteous we look for the one who kissed the Mashiach today we look to those who smell like heaven they might not know the difference between Jesus and Yeshua but there are some Christians that I know that they smell like heaven you might have met some of them they don't know anything about Torah or Judaism but they do smell like heaven and those are the people that God is calling out today. Now in Parashat Toldot, the Torah portion, and then this week, Vayeshev, we're talking about, as I explained to you something, about the level of Biru and overcoming the Biru. The Biru is tough, I told you, because it's conflict. Some of you in the room probably have conflicts with your family because of your Messianic faith. Jew or non-Jew, I'm sure that you have conflicts. But think about Yaakov for a second. Remember what I told you. That the work of the father is a son to the sons. Think about what he had to do with, deal with. He had to deal with Yaakov. He had to deal with Esau. He had to deal with Laban. Lavan. Think about those, all the tikkunim that he has to do through the birurim. Right? And where did he have to do this? He didn't do it in the land of Canaan. He had to leave let me tell you something when you do a birur you always have to go to a lower ground please understand that when you real do a real birur you're going to a lower ground he had to leave a place called Be'er Sheva where he went the avodah of birur it's what we call in Hebrew mesirut nefesh mesirut nefesh is really dedicating your life giving your life for a tikkun and and, and, and Yaakov spent most of his life in Mesirut Nefesh outside of the land. Don't despise it. Don't despise it if God send you to a lower places. He sent you to a lower places because he's setting the ground. Now, then, I want you to pay attention to what's happened the next stage. After Birur, remember Chibur. He is getting ready to join himself back to Esau. You see, that's the final step of Geula. So what does he do? He's returning. He is returning to the land. The bill is over. And he did all the tikkunim. He's ready to go to retirement home. He doesn't need to do anything else. But then, as he's getting ready to do now the Hebrew, he's coming back to the land. And he's about to reconcile with Esau again. And the text says, Vaishlach Yaakov Malachim. The Birur, the Chibur start, if you want to make yourself a note, in Genesis chapter 32 and Genesis 33. That is the final stage. And that is the most important stage today to the Messianic Jewish movement. Vaishlach Yaakov Malachim. He is entering the stage of Chiburim. He is ready to go and face Esau. Look at the text. And Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau to the land of Sa'ir, to the country of Edom. That's the beginning of the Hebrew. Now, who do you think were the Malachim that he sent? What is the word Malachim? Messengers, right? But interestingly enough, he didn't send messengers. 
That's one of those very unique cases that he did not send messengers. Look what Rashi says. Rashi says, and he actually sent real angels. He didn't send messengers. He sent angels. Now, please understand something about angels. Angels are like robots. They have only one job. One job. Then they do this job very, very well. But they do one job. God didn't call the angels. It, it was who that called the angels? It was Yaakov who took them, took them out of their heavenly duties and said, no, no, I'm reassigning you to do this work. Who gave him the authority to do those things? He didn't say God commanded him. He did it. Why did he send Malachim? Why did he send angels? Rashi clearly says that those are not Shlichim. Those are real Malachim. Why did he send them? The reason he sent them and he was not rebuked for doing this because he understood the importance of the message. The importance of the message that he had for Esau. And he knew he knew that if this message is not going to get to Esau appropriately, the Geula will be delayed. Do you understand what I'm saying? He said, I cannot afford chances. He knew that the Tikkun with Esau will not be possible, by the way. He knew that. He knew that. But I want to explain to you now the most important point of this entire Midrash, perhaps. There are two Shorashim, there are two roots here. One Shoresh is the Shoresh of Yaakov. Okay? Yaakov is what's called, there are different worlds. Okay? Yaakov works in what's called the Olam Atikun. In essence, all the life of Yaakov is a struggle, right? It's a struggle, struggle, struggle. He's going through here, he's dealing with Leib, and then he's dealing, he's dealing, he's, he's dealing with Yisra. He is going in his metaken. There are things around him that are broken, and he's just fixing and fixing and fixing them, okay? That's called Olam Atikun. Now, Yisra is not from the Olam Atikun. He's from another world. He's showing his roots. He is from a world that called Olam, Olam, um, Olam Ato, the world of chaos. Now the interesting thing is, this is important, that the root of the Olam of the chaos, the world of the chaos, is much higher than the Olam Atikun. The soul of Esav what I'm telling you now is important. The soul of Esav in Jewish thought is much loftier than the soul of Yaakov. Are you hearing what I'm telling you right now? But what happened is in the world of To, the world of chaos, there are lights all over the place. The Shekhinah is all over the place. But because there is not a vessel to contain the light, the light goes to the other place, very bad place. And that's how we suffer become so wicked. You following what I'm telling you? There is no vessel to contain this light. So this light kind of spread to wickedness. Now in the case of Yaakov, there is the mitzvot, there is the vessel, it's contained. What is better, to be a contained light or to be an infinite kind of light or a great light that cannot be contained in any way? Which one is loftier? Well, it's of light is much loftier, it's much higher. But a light, which represents the truth, without a vessel, means nothing. Just like Yeshua, Isav, without a context, means nothing. You follow what I'm telling you? We can say Yeshua is the King, the Jewish Messiah, but without a vessel to contain him, he is not complete. That's the point. So Yaakov understand this. So he said, I have to do everything in my power to rectify Esau. That's why he's sending an angels. You see, this light, this, this the Olamato, the world of Esau, okay? Those lights are so powerful. But the second there is nothing to contain the light in Hasidic point, they fall, okay? 
In essence, if you have a truth and the truth is not dressed properly, you can all you have the naked truth, right? In Judaism, this idea of the naked truth, in Hasidics, it's called klipa. Klipa is like a husk, it's a shell. And it's fall to a place that you cannot easily identify. Wicked become good and good become wicked. And they mix together and you cannot really discern what is good and what is wicked. That's what happened to Esau. Is he wicked? Of course he's wicked. But his source is loftier than Yaakov. And Yaakov is doing everything in his power to redeem Esau. This great light, according to Hasidut, is the light Esau come from. Remember, Esau is Christianity. You want to know what the root of Christianity is? Not wickedness. What's the root of, of this? The highest of the highest. But it's a truth that is not metukenet. It's not a truth that can be palatable. It's like, what is your favorite food? Right, pasta. I love pasta, but can you eat an uncooked pasta? No. You cannot. You get a stomach ache. The same is true about this light. If it is not processed properly, and Yaakov says, I have to process this light to bring a tikkun to my brother. But I have to find the right vessel. So what he's doing? He's preparing the vessel most of his life. He is laboring and laboring and laboring. All the tikkunim that he's doing in his life is to prepare the vessel for the future meeting with Esau. You understand? Everything that Yaakov is doing is boiled down to Genesis chapter 32. For the moment he is going to meet Esau. The highlight of his life is right there in this point. Right there. This is the crunch time. Fourth quarter, two minutes left. Four down. That's it. He prepare himself. Yaakov is fully, fully metukan. Yaakov light is metukan. He is perfectly metukan. And now he says, now I have a message to Esau. Listen to me. He did the tikkunim from Lemata. He did them in a way that he's doing it. So he brought tikkun from heavenlies. And now he says, I'm ready. To bring the Geulah. I'm ready to reconcile with Esau. Because the moment that Esau, the moment that Esau, the moment that Christianity reconciled with Judaism, with Yaakov, Esau is no longer wicked. The Toma is moved. And he, offer, he become a great Sadiq. You understand that? Yes. So Yaakov knows that all the tikkunim, all the biurim are done. He's done everything, and this is important. And he said, I'm ready for the final stage of Geula. I'm ready, that's it. We're in the final stage. And he wants to see the Geula complete. So he's coming back to the land. Again, the Geula is in the land. After we went away from the land, and he says to Esau, come back home. You want to know the message that he is giving? Come back home. This should be the message for us today to the world. Return home. Return to the house of Israel. Your church is not your home. Your home is the house of Israel. Come back home. So he's not taking chances. He's sending the Malachim. And he says, come on, work with me. Malachi Sharet. They have one job. That's why God did not rebuke him. Because God knew that he is trying to bring the Tikkun to the Shoresh, to the root of Esau's soul. Everything is ready. But something went wrong. He's sending the Malachim. The Malachim, by the way, look at the language here. What did you notice? He says, they sent the Fanav Isav, and then he called him Achiv, his brother. And, and, and Orachim asked the question, why is he called Isav and his brother? Why is he called both? Because he's both his brother and his enemy at the same time. Are you following what I'm saying? His Klippa is the enemy. Inside is his brother. Yeshua is our brother, and Yeshua is also our enemy. Yeah? 
That's why Yeshua is Satan and Redeemer at the same time. Are you following what I'm telling you? It depends how we look upon him. And a matter of fact, he sent him to stay a dome to the field of blood. He's sending, that's literally what is it. Sadeh Edom to the field of blood. You know what is there Edom in Gematria? Satan. 360, Sasatan. He's sending them to Satan. Yes, Israel needs to reconcile with Satan. In some regard, because the word Satan means the adversary. That's what Satan means. I know this is very, very deep, but I want you to get it. Because you will understand it. So he's sending him a message saying, I need this reconciliation because the Geula is not complete without you, Esau. What a message. What a message. The Malachim are returning. There is a problem. The Tikkun from above already happened. He spent all his life doing the Tikkunim. But he's not ready. Who is not ready? Esau is not ready. Esau is not ready and he's returning back with a message. Not only that he's not ready, he's sending 400 men to kill you. See? Yes, he did the Chibu. And I want to encourage you with this. He did the Chibu. He did the best, the Biru, definitely. He did the Chibur, he prepared, he invited his brother, and it is yet was not enough. Some of you want to do the Tikkunim today, and you maybe will do the Chiburim, and I'm telling you, it is not going to be enough. Because we are in the burping of the Mashiach. Why is it not enough? Because there is a difference between the tikkun to the reality, the earthly reality. Okay, that's why. In Hebrew it's called metziut ha-tachtona. Although you can do a tikkun and chibur today, it still might not be enough. But if hundreds of us or thousands of us will do a tikkun together, it will change the reality of Esau. Don't be discouraged. Think about how discouraged he might be to Esau. All of his life, he, for Yaakov, all of his life he prepared for this moment. And it was a big failure. It is almost like we can say the things that Yaakov has done from up, affected up, down. But there are some things that need to happen down below that's going to affect up. And that's have to do with the heart of Isav. You see, Isav was simply not ready. Isav could stop and say, what was the worth of the work that I have done? What a waste of my life, he could have said. I have done all those tikkunim, all those mitzvot, all this gmilut chasadim. For this, and it is all gone to waste. It's all lehevel. And Rick, it's all for vanity. But that's not what he did. You know what Esau did? I mean, what Yaakov did, excuse me. He says, I understand that I cannot have a geula with, with Esau. I cannot have the complete geula. So I will continue to do the tikkunim. I will continue to do the chiburim. Okay? And look what he's doing. What is he doing? He could say, forget it. But he didn't say, forget it. The next text, the text tells us he did. He sent sacrifices. He's sending camels, mules, all those things. Now, Rashi asked the question, why did he send those animals? Sacrifices. Wait a second, but camels? Are they kosher? He is sending an animal that are not kosher and sacrifices. And listen to what Hasidus says. He says it is okay that he didn't send an unkosher animals because he is not working in the olam of a tikkun. He is working in another world, the olam of the toe. And the world of the toe is a world without boundaries, is a world above the Torah. That's why Yeshua is above the Torah. Because Yeshua is not found today in the Olama Tikkun. He's found in the Olama Toh. He is above the Torah. 
Are you following what I'm explaining to you today? Mashiach is the Olam Atav, just like Esav. And it is not a world that is defined by the boundaries of Torah. It is not the world defined by the boundaries of Torah. Why is he sending those sacrifices to him? The word of 1 Corinthians 9.19 come to light when he says, He is to be all things to all people. He's sending him those gifts because he's trying to attract him to come and reconcile. To bring those lights from the world of the Tau back to Yaakov. The job of Yaakov today, the job of Messianic Judaism is to see those lights inside Esau, inside Christianity and pull them out and bring them out. Do not focus on the darkness. Don't be antagonistic. Don't be hateful. Don't be anti-Christians. Learn from Yaakov. Part of the Chibur is bringing the sparks out. You see, the first stage is the stage that Yaakov prepared his life for. Genesis 32, and it was a disaster. But we're ready to see what happened in Genesis 33. Something happened finally to Esau. Yes, you see the Geula. His heart finally started to soften up. And it is Esau who ran them to Jacob. And Jacob recognized it and he reconciled with him. And that's the complete Geula. It's a picture of the complete Geula. And we are working right now in a real time where God is going to reconcile the two. So what do we need to do? What's the upshot from this lesson? What do we need to do right now? What do we need to do when Yaakov reached Esau and Esau refused to cooperate? What are we to do? We continue to do our work. We are continue to send sacrifices, even a non-kosher sacrifices, to bring Esau from Holamato back home to the Olam, to Olam Asiya, you know, to the Olam that, of, that will bring the reconciliation. And this joining of those lights, because I'm telling you something, the thing that I want you to understand is Yaakov needs the light of himself because it's much greater light. You see, it's almost like saying that the light of Jacob is the light of Avodah. Judaism is around Avodah. He fights all of his life. Think about how much Jacob has to work, right? To, he had to work to earn his bride, then he had to work again. Think about how much work he had to do. It's all about that. Judaism is based on these struggles and avodot. But the other lights, it's the light of the Spirit of God. It's the light from above. And today this light is found with Esau. The Spirit is found with Esau. That's why Jacob needs this reconciliation. And this reconciliation can come only through the chibur of these two. So we must today to make sure that our water go forward, go out to the world, to a places that you cannot imagine. Don't, the problem in the messianic movement today, I believe that these people become so mean when they understand that they are Beru. When they complete their Beru, their personal Beru about Mashiach, they immediately condemn everybody else who has not done the Beru. So your job is not to... Don't do that. Help others to do the Beru, and you do that by bringing the Chibu, the Chibu, the connection. Amen. Anybody have questions? Any questions? Yeah. I didn't understand well when you mentioned that the crown of glory is or yeah, well, you missed yesterday, but yesterday we talked about this a little bit. The fact of the matter is, is when Esau and Yaakov were fighting, when they're mingling against each other, they were actually fighting for the crown, okay? And because actually Esau's soul is a loftier soul, the, the crown in essence belongs to Esau, not to Yaakov, okay? So... The crown today, 
I called it to Judaism, okay? And, and you actually see that. Uh, you see it in Isaiah chapter 63. The crown is in Edom. The crown is in Edom. But it's also said that, that in Zechariah chapter 3, I believe it says that fire consumed the city from within. Just as it says in Isaiah 63, who is the one who is coming from Edom to destroy Edom? So he's going to destroy, destroy Edom. Please understand, he's going to destroy Edom, but he's going to spare a remnant who are not really Edom. They're, they're, they are belonging to Yeshua. Okay? So the count today, the glory, is, is definitely with Esau. It's not with Jacob. Because Jacob is not complete without, with, without him. Okay? He's not complete without uh, Esau. Esau needs Jacob just as much as Jacob needs Esau. But the birur of, of, of Esau has to be done by Jacob. Okay? And the problem that we've been having the last 2,000 years is a complicated problem because I, I don't think Esau is ready to receive this joining Yaakov. But look at this generation now. This is the first generation in 2,000 years that Gentiles do not kill Jews who study Torah. This is the first generation in 2,000 years, which means that there are parts of Esau that are finally awakened and are preparing and their hearts are softened. Yes? And a matter of fact, we all in the room represent Esau in some level if we're a follower of Yeshua. Esau is Yeshua at the end of the day. Yes. Any other question? Yes. What does it really mean when you say about the non kosher ancestors? How would that mean for us? And what would it mean for us today? When I talk about okay. What it actually means that you meet people where they at and you bring them where they he understood that. You see, Esav operated in another paradigm. He was a man, he says you're dead side, you know, he was a world, he was in the world. So that's what he understood. So what Yaakov did, he met him in the own turf that he know, and that's how he brought the light out of Esau. So what does it mean to you? Is that you go to your friends and your family, and you don't beat them outside the head. You are meeting them where they are at, and that's how you bring them out of Edom. All right? You don't bring them out of Edom with condemnation. You even notice here in the text that Yaakov not once condemned himself. There is not even a hint of that. On the contrary, he's desperate for the reconciliation. May I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, Vora. This would mean then when our families are still celebrating Christmas and Easter, that we don't need to condemn them? No, we don't. If we're, if we're together, we can still honor what they're doing by yeah. being silent. Yeah, yeah. Them. yeah, look, look, look it's, it, it, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's more than just this. Don't, don't get caught up on the Christmas or this. It's, it's more than that. It's the idea that your job today is not to be in the BU. Get out of this business. Get out of the business of Beirut. Judaism knows exactly where is the Mashiach. Judaism knows where he is at. It's known for 2,000 years. Get out of the Beirut. Get into the business right now of the Hebrew. And do whatever you need to do to, to join people. You know, to join people. And look what it is. Abraham did the master in Hebrew. Look how many people he brought to his tent. Yaakov did the same thing. Isaac did the same thing. It said so. That was the greatness of the fathers. So that's where should be our focus. Not on this argument. I mean, just open Facebook and look. I'm negative everybody against everything. That is not bringing a chibur. Right? That's, that's the point of the matter. And this chibur is an historic chibur. There's going to be a conflict in this chibur. Okay? But I tell you, the chibur will, will, will take place. It is already taking place. Look at Israel, all those centers of Orthodox Jews that are teaching Torah to go in. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Okay? Um, you know recently that Rabbi Ginsburg mm -hmm. called for, the, for Yaakov to start teaching Torah. There you go. That's yeah. Like huge. Right. 
Right, but, but you have to understand that that is because Hasidut, what we learn today when the Shur of Hasidut, that this is the principle of Hasidut. Reconciliation is not inside the house of Jacob. The reconciliation between Jacob and Isa, Judaism and Christianity. Now, I think where, where Hasidic uh, Judaism misses the point, we reconcile the two so that Isa really will return back to Israel, Yeshua. They just want to make them all Jews. That's the difference. But I think uh, I have a different take on this, you know. But I think we're very, very close. Yeah. 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 Two questions. OK. What's Hasidut mean? Hasidut is a sect. Remember when I talked about Hasidut? Hasidut is a sect of Judaism that traced up, let's say, truly in the 18th century that really have to deal with the anti-rationalism. Rationalism, rationalistic Judaism is truly about the mind. Hasidut is really the idea that God is in everything and everywhere, and you have to reveal him to the world. You have to, to, reveal, to reveal his light and fun in everything, and that's what Hasidut is about, okay? It's about the idea that you're partnering with God, rather than the, think about the relationship between, I remember I talk about the sun and the moon, right? the sun is being much bigger than the moon. For the sun and the moon, according to Hasidut, represent you and God. You are equal partner. You are equal. You are, you are truly a partner with God. You are in the same level. Okay? When you said it was out of town, you said Hebrew. I'm sorry? The word out of town in Hebrew. Out? Oh, chutz. Chutz. Out of the country, out of the world. Chutz. Chutza. Yeah, and that's the word that appears in Proverbs chapter 5. When it says really to take the word outside, outside the boundaries, and the boundaries is the house of Israel, right? And I think the Messianic Jewish world really need to figure out it pretty quickly. If we don't, will we come really bringing the word outwardsly? We're going to miss a big, we're going to miss the bus. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. Then? Um, what percentage of Jews worldwide? Or Hasidim, and how does the rest of Judaism look at the Hasidim? Well, look, Chabad is the fastest growing uh, sect of Judaism. That's all what you need to know. And, and I'll tell you why it is. Because the message of the Hasidut, of like Chabad to the world, is a message that says, hey, you can do something today. You can be a partaker in the Geulah. You can partner with God. And that, that is a message for a Jew that... that that the Jew wants to hear. We, we want to see the Geulah. We want to hasten the Geulah, you know? So I would say the Hasidut, you know, obviously there's a lot to reject all Hasidic thought, but to me, Hasidut is messianic, the messianic faith. It's simple. Yeah? I have not even had a chance to talk about it, but all those concepts we talked about, you see in the New Testament, all so clearly. All so clearly. So, Hasidut in essence saying that you can do something today, even if it's of rejecting you, you can still do something to prepare the ground. So sort of recognizing Yeshua, they're the closest aspect or sect of Messianic. And I wouldn't want to say that they're not recognizing Yeshua. They don't represent the clip of Yeshua. What is it to say when the Goim returning back to the Torah with faith in Yeshua that they will not recognize Yeshua? I believe they will. I believe that this entire world will, will through the Chabad network. I believe that the, God used the Rabbi and, and is using the Hasidic movement now. And I, I really believe that, that you know, when the Klippa will be removed, it will be permissible. But it's a, it's a legal issue then. Until the Klippa is not removed, it's, it's not going to be possible. And the only way that the Klippa... You see, the problem, they, they want the Hebrew to happen to Judaism. The Hebrew to me will happen to Mashiach in a Jewish context. There's a little bit different. But God is going to sort that piece out without, without a doubt. Yeah? Rabbi, do you think that what uh, Ariel Cohen Aloha is trying to do with this... Uh, mm. Retrial. You know, for, first of all, what Ariel is done before we trial, you know, I wrote the book, The Return of the Kosher Pig. I spoke about a similar concept long, long, long before he talked about retrials. I think the concept is, is true. 
the, the so concept. It's part the, of the chibur. Yeah, it's part of the chibur, right? And and, and uh, I tell you where I disagree. He, he, he believes that only a Kohen can do this chibur, and he believes it's himself. That's where I have a problem with this. That's the only problem I, I say I have not with the concept. I think each and every one of us are responsible for the chibur between Judaism and Christianity. That's, that's, that's where I'm having a problem with what he's saying. But uh, the concepts are definitely there. That's the foundation, the foundation. And thankfully, Sav is finally opening up. So Baruch Hashem, yes. Good, yes. They all are redemption. They're all stages of the redemption. The Birur is really understanding who is, the, who is Mashiach, who is Yeshua, belonging to the Jewish people. But the Chibur is what you do in essence, in physicality, to bring him to the world, which is talking about truly reconciliation between Judaism and Christianity. The both aspects of the, the Geulah. So the Geulah started starting with, with a conflict, it's going from the concept to the biru. Think about a the trial. Then you get a, you, you, you get a verdict. But the real issue is not with the verdict. You see, uh, that's the thing also you ask about. The, it's one thing to have a verdict. It's another thing. What do you do with the... What, how do you execute it? Yeah? That's the key. All right. Yes? Are there any Hasidic books that you would recommend to understand some of the concepts that you're talking about? Hundreds. Which one would you think? I mean. uh, if you want to read one, I would say you read the Tanya. The Tanya is uh, uh, by uh, Schneo, uh, Zalman Schneo. That's the foundation book of all Hasidut. If you want to start something, you start with that. I mean, the Tanya. And it's available in English. Yeah. And that's the foundation of all of Hasidut. Ultimately, I tell you, the New Testament. It's a really great book. Uh, it's one of my favorites. If you really want to understand Hasidut. Yeah. It's actually even used the word Hasidut in the text. You know, the book of Titus, it says, I'm writing you this book on the context of Hasidut. So you see it. Yes. So is it from Chesed? It's come from the word Chesed. Yes, it's related to the word Chesed. But Hasidut really have to deal with your Ashkafa, with your... Uh, the way you view the world, and you view the world not in a rationalistic way, you view the world through the lens of God to an ultimate joining yourself with Hashem. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. So, I hope everybody... Oh, yes, one more question, yeah? Um, when Yaakov changed, gets his name changed to Israel, mm -hmm. is there a Baru, how he dislocates his hip? Yes. What about it? What do you want to know? Will he wrestle with the angel? Yeah. Is there a reason why it is him? Well, there's a lot of reason, but I think the most important thing is to understand who he wrestled with. He's wrestled with the Mashiach, but he also wrestled at the same time with Satan. He called Satan and he's called Messiah at the same time in Judaism. And the reason is again, Esau is Satan and Mashiach at the same time, is both, yes? And only we can remove the klipa, we can always be, be Mashiach, yeah? And that's the schibu. That's what we have to do right now. That's why, in essence, what I'm telling you today, you need to get busy. If I, if I were to say one word, if you really love Mashiach, get busy and ask the question, what do you do to bring people to Mashiach? What do you do? Not studying. Who do you bring? Who do you connect to the Messiah? That's, that's, that's the message of Hasidut. Yeah? You see, even to bring in the gospel is a form of Hasidut in some way. The problem is when they talk about bringing the God to the gospel, they don't talk about, the, about Jacob. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Anyway, let me pray. I hope it was a good shiur for you. This was a deep shiur. That was not an easy shiur. But we bless the name of the Lord. Avinu Thank you that each one of us, Lord, 
are called to go through a conflict, and those conflicts will lead to birurim, but ultimately those birurim mean nothing if there are no real, if there are no real chibu between us and the world around us, between us and Esau and between us and Yaakov. We are Messianic Jews, we are kind of stuck in the middle. And Lord, I just believe that we need to have a chibur, both to Yaakov and to Esau at the same time. So Lord, give us the opportunity to attract many, both Jewish people and Goyim, to yeah. come in Amen. and to join ourselves, even if we have to bring things from the Olam Ato, unkosher things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, because your name is kosher. So use us to bring the people to the ultimate preparation for this historic reconciliation. In the name of Yeshua. Amen and Amen. Amen and Amen. I wish you Shavua Tov. Those who watch online, I hope you are blessed. It's going to be available for those of you who want in our YouTube channel. Also, uh, those of you who want to uh, bless, I know it's cost money to rent this place and, and all of these things. There's a Tzedakah box. Those who want to support this work, thank you very much. Anybody who wants to look at our resources, Lori, I, I have my suitcase, people, you can open it. People who are interested, you can look. Um, we bless you with Shavuot Tov, and we hope it was a fruitful time for you. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>